Thank you for staying with me on Crunch Econometrics, still on the Eteru Elasticity series. In this video, we will consider ways of detecting the problem of Eteru Elasticity. In the previous video, we understood the nature, causes, and consequences of the problem. Now, in this video, we are going to take a look at informal and formal ways by which we can detect the problem of Eteru Elasticity in any model. The truth is that there is no hard and fast rule for detecting the problem. Therefore, more often than not, heteroscedasticity may be a case of educated guesswork, your previous empirical experiences, or by mere speculation. However, there are informal and formal approaches by which the problem can be detected. The informal approach is by plotting the residuals from the regression against the estimated dependent variable, while the formal is by performing various econometric tests. There are several tests of heteroscedasticity, each having its own assumptions. Any interested reader, you may want to consider or consult the various references that I've listed at the end of this video. So if you are ready, please load your data, and if you want to use mine, I'll be using the Acero and Hall HPRIZE data. I have the link to the file in the video description and the file is located on my website. Click on the link and it will take you to the file. This is what we intend to do. We intend to plot each regressor against the predicted value of the dependent variable for us to know which of them drive heteroscedasticity in the model. We are using three variables in this model, price, rooms, and square feet. Price is a dependent variable why rooms and square feet are the independent variables. So let's get started. So right here we are in AVIUS interface. So let's start with rooms and price. We click on price, press down your control key, click on rooms, right click, open as a group. Next, you go to view, select graph. Under the specific kind of graph you want, scroll down, select scatter, maneuver to fit lines, Open this dialog box and select regression line. Under axis and scaling, click on that. Maneuver to series axis assignment. My price, I want it to be on the left axis, so I change from bottom to left. I click the left button. And for the rooms, I want it to be at the bottom. So I leave it at bottom. It's already checked here. I click OK. So this is the graph showing that rooms shows a clear evidence of heteroscedasticity in this model. As the quantity of rooms keep increasing from 1, 2 to 8, we can see that the model shows clear evidence of the problem of heteroscedasticity. Let's consider the second one, which is price and square feet. We do the same thing, click on price, click on square feet, right click, open as a group, then you go to view, maneuver to graph, Scroll down and select scatter. For the fit lines, open this and select regression line. Always remember to come to axis, click on axis and scaling. Number one, I want price to be at the left axis again. I click the left button. And for bottom, I want square feet to be there, which is fine. Bottom is checked, I click OK. So here we see that between price and square feet, there is also an evidence of heteroscedasticity, though a much weaker evidence of heteroscedasticity in this particular uh, plot compared to when we had price and rooms. So these are the informal ways by which you can know the model is heteroscedastic. So now let us consider formal detection of heteroscedasticity. On the screen, I have three equations. A cross-sectional equation, equation 1, a time series equation in equation 1a, and a panel data equation in equation 1b. Equation 1 is cross-sectional given the subscript i. Equation 1a is time series with a subscript t, and equation 1b is panel data with a subscript it. And you can also see the construct of the variance which shows heteroscedasticity. It also has a subscript I for cross-sectional, T for time series, and IT for panel data. 
So now let's consider some heteroscedasticity test. There are so many of them out there, I have only considered just seven for this tutorial. Brushpagan, Glessa, Havigovi, Parkelem, Concabasset, Gofiquant, and White. Each of them have their own auxiliary equation. And how do you get to this auxiliary equation? From equation one, which is the multivariate cross-sectional model. Once you're able to execute this, you extract the residual. For Bruchpagan, the residual is squared and regressed on the regressors. For Glesser, you use the absolute value of the residual and regress it on the independent variables. For Havegovi, you use the log of the squared residuals and regress it on the independent variables. For PAC-LM, you use the log of the squared residuals and regress on the log of the independent variables. For concabasset, you use the squared residuals and regress on the predicted value, that is the squared predicted value of the dependent variable. Gopher quant is a bit different, is mostly applicable for cross sections, but not suitable for multivariate models. It's only for univariate models because you have to divide the sample into two. So I won't be covering Gopher quant in this series. So next we move to white. For white, you use the squared residuals and you regress it on the independent variables, the squared independent variables, and their cross terms. So depending on the test you want to deploy, you execute your auxiliary equation, and the next thing you have to do is to formulate your hypothesis. And what will be your null hypothesis? Is that the coefficients from the auxiliary regression are all equal to zero against the alternative that at least one of the coefficients is different from zero and that at least one of the regressors affects the variance of the residuals. Let me take you back to the table. So this is what you are testing, the deltas, the slope coefficients. You are testing that they are equal to zero, that is they are homoscedastic. Against the alternative that at least one of the regressors drive heteroscedasticity. So these are the deltas you are testing. And what will be your decision criteria? You can use two, either the LM or the P value. For the LM, you multiply the number of observations by the R squared from the auxiliary regression. If the statistic is higher than the chi-square statistic, then you reject the null and conclude that there is significant evidence of heteroscedasticity. And if you are using the p-value, once the p-value is lower than 0.05, you reject the null and also conclude that there is significant evidence of heteroscedasticity. So let's take a look at the process of engaging the bruch pagan LM test. Let's see how far we can derive um, the LM statistic and the um, chi-square statistic. So this is step one obtain the residuals from the regression, which is the regression. Next, estimate the auxiliary regression, formulate the hypothesis, as earlier on explained. Step four, compute either the LM statistic as given by this equation or the F statistic. And given that the LM statistic is quite easier to compute, so we will go with the LM statistic. Same decision criteria, once the LM statistic is higher than the chi-square statistic, we reject the null hypothesis of homoscedasticity. Or if the p-value is lower than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis of homoscedasticity. So back to e-views, we need to formally test for heteroscedasticity. We go to quick, estimate equation. Now we type the variables price, dependent variable, C, constants, rooms, independent variable, and square feet, the second independent variable. So this is the result from the least squares estimation. The next thing to do is to obtain the residuals from this regression. So go to PROC, 
click on make residual series here i can change it give it a new name for the residual i can call it p res that is price residual i click ok so we have the residuals generated here if i minimize it you can see here p res is generated so the next thing to do is to generate the square of the residuals so i use the generate button here click on it and here i type a new name that is p res 2 which is the name i'm giving the square of the residuals equals p res raised to the power of 2. so i've told eviews generate a new variable for me called p res 2. i click ok so here you have it p res 2 is the square of the residuals this is what we are going to use to execute the auxiliary regression. So we go to quick estimate equation. So now we use P rest to constant rooms square feet. We click OK. So this is the auxiliary regression. Look at the dependent variable here, PRS2. This is the square of the residuals. So from here, we can compute the LM statistic using the formula N is 88. And the R squared is 0 0.120185, as you can see here. Before we compute the R squared, let us generate the chi square for this regression. We use generate chi equals at Q chi square, open the bracket, 0 0.95, comma, at 2 degrees of freedom. Close the bracket press the enter key. If I minimize this, I can see a new variable here, chi. Let me double click on that. So we can see the chi square statistic here is 5.991465. So you need to write that down so that we can compare the results. So this is 5.991465. So remember our results for the auxiliary regression. Remember this is PRS2. So let's compute the LM statistic from here. Remember, n is 88. This is 88 times r squared from the regression is 0 0.120185. 0 0.120185. Let's multiply that together. And we have 10.57628, which is clearly greater than the chi square statistic of 5.99. So from here, we can conclude that this model is heteroscedastic. So this is manually deriving in a formal way if your model is heteroscedastic or not. So we have simply gone through the underlying algorithm of the Bruch pagan test. So to save yourself all this stress, we can do what we usually do. Let's go back to estimates. And instead of using the squared value of the residual let's use the dependent variable price every other thing remains the same i click ok so here we have the outcome of the underlying regression so we simply go to view we go to residual diagnostics and we click on heteroscedasticity test the first one is indicated bruch pig and Godfrey, and you can see here is the square of the residual that will be used and the regressors remain the same, rooms and square feet. If you click OK, so on the screen you have the results of the Bruch, Pagan, Godfrey test. If you take a look at the UPS R square, which is the LM test here, 10.57632, very close to what we obtained when we manually derived it, very close to our figure, almost the same thing. If you look below the table, you can see the result is exactly what we got when we did our auxiliary regression, it's the same result. There's no difference. And looking at the p-value of the LM statistic, clearly below 0 0.05. So this one tells you that the model is heteroscedastic. So either you go through this way, or you can manually derive um, the bruch pagan test using the approach I just showed you. So overall, we have detected that this model is heteroscedastic. So that concludes our video on how you can detect heteroscedasticity. I will encourage you to please go through one or two references here. I have so many of them 
from the textbooks I used to prepare this series to various references on the different heteroscedasticity tests for you to know their various underlying assumptions. So we have covered how to detect heteroscedasticity using either formal approach or informal approach. The next video will be to show you how you can resolve or correct for heteroscedasticity using functional form with least squares or the white robot standard error text. Thank you for watching and thank you for supporting my channel. I appreciate my viewers, my subscribers and as many who are sharing my link. Crunch Econometrics is dedicated to teaching beginners and intermediate level users. Please don't go away. I'll be right back with the videos on how you can correct heteroscedasticity.